Hey everybody, so today we are going to take a deeper dive into Data Mesh. Now, you might have caught my overall business perspective on the general applications of Data Mesh and also Data Fabric. But today we are going to be talking to John Cook, who is somebody that has been working with Data Mesh for quite some time. He is a true advocate, he's very active in the community, and he also happens to be the founder of a company that is working to create products for Data Mesh to empower you at your own company to use these practices. So this is something that we're gonna get a sneak peek into in this video, and we're just going to have a great conversation about what is a Data Mesh and what are some of those great things from a deeper dive from John Cook to understand why these are so valuable and how they're gonna to continue to grow. So if this sounds like something you are interested in, Keep on watching. All right, so I am joined today by John Cook. So John, do you want to introduce yourself? What is the company that you, uh, you're the CTO, right? That's right, CTO and, and, and founder of, um, of Dataception. And uh, uh, yeah, basically it's, uh, we're a company who um, has a couple of couple of strands with basically data platform experts who've been building data platforms, have you know, experienced the last 10 years, and myself personally, the last 15 years across banking and lots of different sectors, mm -hmm. about 10 or 20 cross domain, a data analytics and the analytics platform. So, um, and I formed the company, I say, two years ago to actually start, really sort of start taking it out to the market. We've also got a data mesh products, which is um, due to, it's about to be released. So, um, yeah, and that's obviously super, super interested and keen around the whole data mesh movement. I think it's a, it's a, it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. Having gone through the whole Hadoop kind of, you know, big data, data lake, um, you know, journey and take, take a lot of banking clients through that. So I did see there's actually a gap in the market and really a different a different way of doing stuff. And I think the data mesh is, actually solves a lot of the problems which I've seen over the last 10 years. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I mean, you know, there's there's still a lot of people that are even struggling with the concept of, a, of uh, you know, a data lake, let alone getting into data mesh. That's so right. it's, it's really yeah. great to know that there are companies and folks like yourself that are out there trying to educate and also empower because you have a tool that's coming out as well. So can you tell us a little bit about that tool? What is it What is it going to be used for and what is the main um, like user persona of that tool? Yeah, no, it's a very, very good question. So um, the, the tool is effectively what I call an enterprise data mesh. And um, the, the sort of data mesh concept um, originally proposed by Zamek back in 2019 um, is obviously a, has a very set, you know, clear set of principles around that, um, around basically the, the main one being product thinking. And in a, in a, in a previous um, you know, uh, interview I did with on the Data Leader website, we talked a lot about product, kind of product thinking, going for kind of centralized mm -hmm. monolithic applications, centralized data models, you know, star schemas mm -hmm. in the data warehousing world, you know, centralized kind of pipelines and ingestion teams and stuff like that. And the 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 the, the mesh that um, we've built is actually to try and really decentralize that, to actually put it into the hands of the business, to you know mm -hmm. allow people to really onboard data, to create you know analytics models, to be able to create dashboards and that type of completely on in a self service way. And we mm -hmm. then deploy them across a whole organization. You know, one of the things I found is obviously a lot of people are transitioning to cloud, but some people sit on prem. If you get there's lots of lots of tools out there, you can do do, do cloud provisioning, that type of stuff, especially with the cloud providers, but actually they don't really serve the, the on-prem market as well. So <laughs> being able to have you deploy, you know, your, your analytics um, you know, deliveries to different cloud providers, but also to your main data centers, to the edge as well, and all that kind of stuff. So it's really trying to bridge that I sort love of yeah, no, I love that idea. So, I mean, you're right. Um, in my day job, I have to review a lot of vendors for this as well. It's a mega organization that I work for. Um, but so, okay, tell me a little bit about that if you if you can. Sure. So, how do you mesh? I should probably use a different word in this conversation. <laughs> how do you how do you work? towards something that is on-prem as well as on cloud, because there are so many people that are doing like a lift and shift where they really have a lot of problems going up into the cloud, or they just really have such a big and complicated organization or even process. It could be a small organization with a really complex process that they just don't know how to get their hands around that. So can you tell me like what's some of the methodology that you're using for that? Sure, sure. so, so um, we also sort of think about some, um, you know, analytics, applications, components, deliveries, whatever you want to call them, in a, in a sort of what we call a data product centric way. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk in the, in, around the mesh and these kind of new architecture about data as a product. I've just been on LinkedIn around data as a product versus data as a service. Um, mm -hmm. The way I think about it is uh, we talk, I talk about data product. A data product to me is a completely encapsulated 
um, delivery of a piece of insight, analytics. I mean, mm. in, a, in my view, and this is my own personal view, the mesh mm. and these architectures really lend themselves more towards analytics rather than sort of operational processes. Mm -hmm. Again, there's mm. jury still out on this, and you know, there's a, there's a lot yeah. of talk around you know um, data mastering and that type of stuff as well. But for mm -hmm. I guess my experience has been around the analytics space. So. One of the key challenges I've seen around building analytics on cross, you know, cross domain, cross divisional um, platforms is the high friction involved with, you know, when a, when a business actually asks for a new piece of insight, it could be a piece of ad hoc analysis, it could be a new model. It could be <laughs> Good a luck. <laughs> well, exactly right. So what happens? The request goes into the, the potentially the, the the business analytics team. The business analytics team go, "Have we got the data? Have we got something we can use with existing?" No, we don't. So we go to the central team. Can we onboard? Can we find the data? Can we onboard it? Can we build the, the, the pipelines? And then you know, once it's on board, sometimes there might be some centralized modeling, especially if it's in a data warehouse. Yeah. You know, and the, and the time goes on basically until actually yeah. the, the the business analytics team actually goes before they can actually build the dashboard or do the do the actual the analytics modeling itself. So, um, you know, the, the the challenge we find is we're trying to shortcut that whole process where mm -hmm. we allow the business analytics team to onboard data, to be able to build the analytics in, in the tools that they want, because the other mm -hmm. challenge is a lot of centralized infrastructure. They, they standardize mm -hmm. the tool set, you know, and the business go, oh, no one wants to use it, yeah. Yeah, or just not used to using it, or it's quite technical, you know, to building you know, really yeah. good, user experience analytics tools is actually a very complicated process and a lot of vendors oh, yeah. out there do it very well and that's what they specialize in so getting a kind of a, a, a tech savvy business person to actually build us some analytics <laughs> on a, on a tool is actually, is actually quite tricky so i guess yeah. that's the first kind of piece of that product thinking being able to actually do the self-service onto you know building products for the, the analysis without this kind of centralized teams the second bit is basically having some kind of data virtualization piece in there and mm -hmm. we've got that on our tool and again there's there's, there's quite a lot of debate because the the original data mesh architecture talked about this concept of ports which effectively is like encapsulating a data product which has an input and output port a bit like a, um, a microservice where you've got an mm -hmm. input Mm -hmm. know, that type of stuff. I mean, you, you could also even, I, I, I've heard others describe it as it, it's almost like dockerizing, right? So you just make this thing that is completely serviceable to whoever yeah. you ship it to. Yeah. Indeed, exactly right. But I guess the, the, the balance is there between having something that's completely opaque you know, as a, as a, as a, as a contained um, component versus the reuse. And one of the big uh, discussions we're having now is basically, if you're building a, um, uh, a machine learning model, for instance, part of the process from the raw data is building all the features to actually support the model. Now, mm -hmm. in the data as a product world, with the, with the port concept, this input and output port, port concept, the, the feature set in the middle sits right in the middle of that. So how do you expose that? How do you get that out? And obviously there's a big move around feature stores, which is around the mm -hmm. reuse of those tools, mm -hmm. you know, for across the whole organization. So if you've got a data scientist, who's got a really good bunch of features or does a lot of experimentation, a lot of iteration and produces mm -hmm. a lot of features that aren't necessarily being used, they're mm -hmm. lost. They're basically stuck on a, on, on a, a cloud storage or stuck in a, in a cloud database yeah. or whatever, yeah. and they can't be reused. Um, we think actually we should those should actually be able to be reused, even though they're not strictly a part of the input or the boundaries of that product. So for yeah. us, uh, the data virtualization really comes comes into its own there. So you imagine you launch the product onto onto the mesh in the mm -hmm. catalog, you include a catalog around that, mm -hmm. but you also mm -hmm. tag the the data sets in the catalog as well, so they can be reused for other products. Fundamentally, and, and that is that is so important. And I just want to pause there for a second because that democratization of data is, I think, one of the core tenants of, of the, the technology suite that we're talking about. And having um, a machine learning team that I manage um, with lots and lots of data, um, I will say that the, the responsible AI, being able to reproduce that same output, yeah. Um, even in different use cases and contexts, is so important. And without that data catalog and some of that data mesh technique around, you know, this is a product for people to use in those feature extractions um, so that others at the company can iterate off of too. I mean, that's the other thing. Like if I'm an expert in um, feature extraction and then I have another expert that's better with like that data quality and really understanding like the deep dive into whatever that data is, whether it's finance or, you know, what I deal with is like the the topics of, of research. Right. Um, th that's where you get that um, democratizing of not just the reuse of the data, but people coming together and their different viewpoints and the different experiences, and then just leverages your data in such a unique way that we don't see very often right now because people have these giant monoliths and they can't like crack into it, right? Exactly, yeah.
Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And one of the key words I always use is curation. Yeah, you know, basically, mm-hmm. how do you actually, you know, um, not just um, you know, reuse it, but actually understand what that is, understand what's happened. How do I find it easily? And again, the catalog, you know, people talk about data catalog, but we actually have a kind of a, a data product catalog. So it yep. catalogs the, the actual product itself with all the business metadata, the data yep. sets involved in it, the machine yep. learning models. We had to tag it with taxonomies and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So you can actually mm-hmm. assign it to, to domains. Um, I guess the other thing about products as well, data products, is about the ownership. You know, one of the big things about centralized platforms, and we've seen oh, this yeah. a lot over the years, is basically when, you know, a piece of an insight delivery happens, it's like it gets thrown over to the fence of the central team. Oh, yeah. And the business, oh, yeah. business kind of looks and goes, well, why haven't you delivered that for me? You're, you're the business. You own it. And if, you get, and if you have the product that's actually attached to the business teams, they get that ownership. So it, not only are they own it for delivery, but and they feel a sense of ownership, but, but also... If someone wants to reuse that product, they know where to go to. There's a lot of time thinking mm-hmm. if it's part of a central team. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, it's not all central teams. Some central teams are very good and they, they're very business aligned. So it's not, I don't want to tie them all the same brush. But um, so it's, it's the, always fascinating to me that um, there are so many of these uh, methods and techniques that have existed for a long, like an ontology, for instance. Yeah. The idea of an ontology has been around for generations. It's just we've never yeah. had the true scope and, and compute power to actually do anything with it. And what you're talking about, the um, curation, um, archives, right, like the, the historical documents, it's called provenance. It's been around for a very long time. The legal system has this idea of chain of custody. Same method, same thing that we're talking about. It's just a different label. And so it's so funny to see that these these groups that are very dispersed, I mean, like legal, talking to archive, talking to computer scientists like yourself, they don't usually talk together. (laughs) But we're coming together on this same kind of understanding that understanding who made it, what was done to it, where did it come from, when was the last time it was updated, all of that builds into better data quality and better responsible AI because you know where it came from. You can have a trust factor. Like the semantic web, one of the biggest tenants is trust. Exactly right. And again, the, the sort of the product kind of thinking is trying to trying to really solve that problem by having these encapsulated things, not just from ownership, but who, who to go to, how do, how do I get it changed, who's using it, all that type mm-hmm. of stuff. You know, mm-hmm. um, it gets quite interesting when you start having big cross-domain products and that that sort of stuff. That that, that well gets, and there's obviously quite a lot of debate around kind of what's a domain and is it is it a business function or is it a, a, a business capability and that type of stuff. Um, for us, we try and keep it super simple. It's really about mm-hmm. these two things. It's about if you're building a product, who owns it fundamentally? So basically, what mm-hmm. cost center? Well, who's paying for it? So really, if it's, yep. if it's yep. you know, if it's, and all secondly, of the money. <laughs> yeah, it's all of the money, exactly. And secondly, kind of what is it about? So be able to tag it with metadata. So, so if you've got a tax on it, describes your business capability. So this is an e-commerce mm-hmm. and it's it's actually a recommender mm-hmm. engine and it's using, mm-hmm. you know, um, click, click stream data. You tag them all on and say, oh, I know what's, what's in that, you know. So it's, it's, yep. it's and be able to do that quickly and easily again by the business people because one of the, yep. the other challenges I've seen is you know there's a lot of a lot of metadata tooling out there and stuff and if they're off to the side sometimes of the development process they, they don't get yep. used or they get they struggle mm-hmm. to get used you know or they become much more for control functions rather mm-hmm. than part of the development cycle and, that's, and I think for me it's got to be part of the user experience of actually creating the products themselves and be super super yeah, easy so I can just spin up a um, let's say a, a product or a recommendation and then go oh I, I can tag that really easy I'm just you know drop down tag 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 publish yep. you know, that I guess that's the kind of thing we're, we're, we're trying to look at uh, from our product perspective. No, and I, I love that too because you're right. There's so I came from the taxonomy side of things, now right. I do a lot of other things outside of that. But um, there are you're right, there are so many very unique tool sets to do taxonomy or even like auto assignment of tags on, on content and assets. But you're right, it kind of like lives over here, it does its own little thing, and everyone says, yeah, 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 you're doing great, just keep doing it over there. Meanwhile, a lot of the things that they're doing are being used at all these different downstream processes, and you have no idea Absolutely, what the yeah. ramifications of them are. So I could be you know, assigning categories to something over here in this little space, um, and then you know, somewhere down the line, um, search is saying, "Oh, we see this, you know, um, overwhelming amount of a specific kind of content always showing up in our search engine. Let's do something on the search side to not have that happen." And it's like, no, actually, it's the metadata. That's why it's, it's happening, it's, right? You can't, you can't really like track it unless you have something like what you're talking about. So that's exciting. You said it's your your tool is going to be launching soon. So yep. do you have a launch date yet? 
I'm not quite yet. We're basically um, sort of just, just sort of preparing. It's going to be going to be imminent, and um, we've done some sort of you know test test implementations and stuff like that. But yeah, it's very very soon. So just sort of watch the space. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. And so whenever you get this launched, let me know. I can put in the comments below, the description below um, the website so that people can go and check it out and see what you're all about. And John, you're also on uh, social media. I know you and I connected on LinkedIn, so folks can go and find you there. But otherwise, how would they um, get involved in either the company that you are running or at least, you know, finding out more about what you're doing? So by all means, you know, obviously tag me on LinkedIn, you know, tag me on um, on my, my email, which is uh, John Cook at dataception.com. Um, and also there's we I also participate on a, uh, a Slack channel around the data metrics, which is a really great resource that's run by Scott Lemon. Oh, cool. um, you know, it's a fantastic resource and we, I'll put that into the channel as well. So, you know, get, get involved and really start get involved in the discussion of data mesh because it really is the something that's I think gonna gonna revolutionize the the, the, whole, the whole industry. Absolutely, and I couldn't agree more. So I will put all of that in the description below because I, even if someone is not in the space yet to actually start working on a data mesh, I think it's that thought process and business buy-in at first. So educating yourself on what it is, what are the values and you know how to get started, I think is a great first step for anybody, even if you can't necessarily get into it right away. So we will give you more resources down below for that. All right, and so with that, I really enjoyed my conversation with John. So thank you so much for coming on the channel and make sure you stick around because we will have a vendor deep dive into the product that he mentioned, hopefully sometime soon. And as soon as we get that, it will be in the description below as well as a post that we put at the end of this video. So you can go and check that out as well. And if you have any other vendors or any cool stories or cool personalities in you know this data space please let me know this is a big part of the channel is just sharing those wonderful stories and personalities and tools that we all are coming across in our day-to-day -day work in this space all right so with that i want to thank you very much and i'll catch you next time